Um, I'm a practical kind of girl. I usually have a honker with me to cut people off if they go on too long. Um, and we have the tricky last slot, right? Everybody's been listening very patiently. It's been a long um, but incredibly brilliant and inspiring day. So this is the chance where we get to hear from you. We'd like to hear your questions, thoughts, heckles, um, get involved um, and make this a really good last session. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Teen, an artist and researcher, and I have the joy of working with Teen at the Pervasive Media Studio. Chris from Ravensbourne and Martin from the Nanotechnology um, Knowledge Tr Transfer Network. There's no point in me kind of regurgitating their biogs to you, so I'm going to ask them very briefly, because we are running late, to just give us a sketch of what you do. Teen. Okay, hi. Um, I'm a visual artist. I work with public art and interactive installation. So I quite often work with technology, but quite often from a visual kind of art maker sculptural background. I often collaborate with technologists, with scientists, with companies. And I tend to not worry too much about the definitions about where what I am, except for when I do my PhD, where it's all about definition. And I do that at the Digital Culture Research Center, which is at the Basic Media Studio in Bristol. However, my studio is in London, so I'm kind of spread out a bit. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I have a background in design and creative excellence. I was director of education and professional development at DNAD for seven years and joined Ravensbourne five years ago, scarily, on a three-year contract um, to, to really help reposition Ravensbourne. For those of you that don't know, Ravensbourne was a very famous art and design institution. Uh, people like Jay Oscarby, Bruce Oldfield, the Chapman brothers. Stella McCartney went through its doors and it wanted to reposition itself as it relocated to London with 72 million pounds of investment as a digital media institution. So it dropped all reference to art and design quite um, uh, challengingly. And uh, I came on board to, to embed industry in the institution and build an incubator at the heart of the institution that welcomes and works with uh, artists, uh, software developers, gaming companies, product designers, fashion companies, all in the same space, all in the same environment, and shoulder to shoulder with our students. So a very different model, not only of higher education, but of how industry and education uh, integrate, and so on a daily basis. And I also, at the time, managed our prototyping lab, so created a space where we merged fashion, product, engineering, uh, uh, and architecture, prototyping labs, all in the same space. So now we have um, professionals and students working side by side without any disciplinary boundaries as well, which is, again, is very radical. Cool. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, I'm an ex-research scientist um, working in aerospace and defense. And um, I was working in the composites area and smart technologies for sensing and repair of composites. Um, I then moved into marketing, got hand in my tie. And um, I then really dealt with the uh, marketing technologies. So I created demonstrators, uh, such as Buggles Dragonfly, which would actually sort of animate and do things to show uh, potential customers what the technologies could do. And I think I learned more about science trying to make a model of something than I did actually doing research. So uh, I now do Technology Transfer, which is the Knowledge Transfer Network, funded by the Government Technology Strategy Board. There are a number of those, and uh, I guess we'll cover that later. Cool, thank you. So in some of the extraordinary projects today, there's been a clear articulation of the value of, of uh, collaboration, and in fact, the multiple values of collaboration. But it's not necessarily straightforward or easy if you don't know where to go or how to start. And the challenges that have been coming up, I think, are around language, around different timescales, around the different horizons for R&D, perhaps, and, and how, quick things might, how quickly things might pay off. There's uh, challenges around expectations, around kind of organizational cultures and ways of working. So what happens when very tiny people collaborate with very big people, um, when, when people who can be very quick and responsive uh, collaborate with universities. Um, so <laughs> so uh, where do, um, and after, I'm gonna ask a question to warm you up and then I'm gonna go straight out to you guys. So please have some questions uh, ready. Where do people start? If they want to collaborate, they've been fired up by what they've seen today, they understand the reasons for collaboration, what should they do? Yep. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? So I'll say what I do. I, to know that's, um, I think if we're thinking about technology, I think the kind of first advice I would give is, well, why do you want to use technology? Technology is uh, a tool. It's something you can mold. It's something you can shape. 
And so you have a concept or you have a, an idea or something you want to create, a vision. And then you go about finding a way of executing it. And that might include collaborating with a technologist, um, a company. So you kind of have to seek out, you've got to do your sort of ground research, I think, and actually come, not completely just, uh, I want to make this, can you help me? Because you will gain no respect uh, in that way. So you've got to somehow famili familiarize yourself with the terminology um, of the Arduino world or, you know, uh, metals worlds, etc. that you want to do. And I think really, when it comes down to it, it's a bit of um, just knock on the door, just send an email, give a call, even though I know it's really hard and I find it just as hard as anybody else. But I think there's an inherited wow factor when you step outside your own field that um, always starts at the beginning. So if I meet a scientist or I go to Surrey University or University of Surrey it's called, and I go to the Space Center and there's a PhD student who's working with magnetic fields and I'm making a sculpture which has a magnetic field. So what happens when we meet each other is I go, oh wow, look at your lab, and wow, that's so cool, and you're fantastic. And then he comes to my studio and you go, oh wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know you did that, and I didn't know. So you kind of have this sort of mutual kind of wow factor, which I think really builds a good energy that you can start from. Thank you, Chris. I would say just find the networks and the spaces and the projects that facilitate those kind of different groups of people coming together. I mean, the first thing. I did at Ravensbourne as part of the strategy was go to the networks of the networks of social enterprises, the networks of design agencies, media agencies, um, craft and design uh, agencies, and bring them all in the same space and facilitate different types of people to come together. And that was effectively my job. And I think running an incubator today, that is my job, is facilitating new collaborations between different types of people. Accidentally, it's kind of what I've done throughout the, the whole of my career, really. Um, but we also, and to complement that and finding out who has what skills to offer another person or another group or another company is, is designing uh, business modeling labs uh, that teach people the language and the new business skills that they need to learn to be able to cross collaborate across different disciplines. At the moment, and there's many of these types of projects going on all across the country, in Bristol and in London, and Manchester and elsewhere, that do encourage those cross-sector collaborations. Ravensbourne runs one at the moment called the Digital Media Innovation Consultancy Project. Um, where it gives free access to uh, SME companies uh, and sole traders, uh, artists to come and use the incubator space and collaborate with engineers, software developers, video producers, storytellers, all in the same space. And there's that kind of project going on all over. So find those projects, find those groups. I do still think when you're talking about learning new languages and new skills, the physical is better than the online to really form meaningful collaborations, which is why spaces like Watershed and the Pervasive Media Studio and the Ravensbourne Incubator and everything else around it are so critically important. And just celebrate the differences. You know, I find increasingly people do, with, across media and design and the arts world, we are fundamentally the same people. In many cases, we speak the same languages and increasingly we use the same tools. And what's the worst thing that can happen? Absolutely. People will say, oh, I'm really sorry, it sounds great, but I haven't got time. They're not going to laugh at you, generally. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does happen. Martin, what's the kind of KTN role in this? If I want to start to work with nanotechnology, what, how do you help? Yeah, we are basically marriage brokers. I mean, our job is to bring together two parties that want to form some sort of collaboration or business deal. And um, so we run workshops. We have a website, of course. We have um, groups on the website. Now, there are, there are a number of KTNs. Uh, there's Materials KTN, there's Creative Industries KTN. It's mathematics, and there's all sorts of KTNs, and they're all free, of course. Uh, so you can join the ones that you feel like. There are special interest groups like Additive Manufacture, and there you'll find a whole community of people that are sort of discussing that, and, and perhaps there are opportunities in that space. So uh, echoing Chris, that there's a huge amount of resources available out there. I mean, I joined the British Library recently, and I think, why didn't I do that 25 years ago? And it's an incredible resource. Uh, with access to state-of-the-art publications, very expensive publications, such as uh, consultancy reports. And, um, you know, if you start to look at the networks available, uh, you know, the Crafts Council, the other councils, um, you start delving a bit to see what is actually out there that's free and available, and then what networks I can join. And I think that's a very good uh, starting place. And um, I would just fund, should I men mention funding now? Because Money does help to make if the world If you've got money, go you should tell them, yeah. Well, this is a very, <laughs> it's a very good time, actually, because there, I think there are four funding calls come out this week. I mean, I, this is the silly season, uh, or the very good season. Uh, and um, for small companies, there's Innovation Voucher Scheme. 
and that's, that's just 5,000 pounds for you to go and access a consultant or some, act, some form of help to help you take the next step. There are a number of grants for SMEs. Uh, there's a call this week on sort of recycling, sort of how can you design and make products which you can then reuse and reuse. And I've heard several things today that definitely could bid into that funding call. And this is quite significant amounts of money. But to do that, you don't just go in by yourself. You need to have a, a partnership, a collaboration. And you need a company involved, if you're not a company. And in a, in a way, that's KTN. This can provide you access to potential partners. So you can, you can put a blog onto our websites and say, look, I, I have a, an idea in this space. Uh, I'm looking for partners. Or you, you come to us, and maybe we have a list of uh, companies who, who might be playing in that space. So, so there is actually funding available at the moment, which is quite unusual. So, I think, I mean, there is an argument, though, that some of that stuff is overkill and could kill a collaboration before it even had chance to understand what it might be. I mean, we see, we do the TSB um, funding that we work, kind of work with the KTNs, but also I think sometimes people just need permission and just to start making together and, and just to kind of see where that goes and to be much quicker and more agile than unfortunately some of the funding schemes can kind of um, cope with. So I guess maybe what I would say is, sort of do that first, make together and play together a little bit first and then come in to you. Do you think that's fair? I would do both at the same time, you know, just do them in parallel. I mean, basically, uh, I run a group called Nano for Design and, you know, with the next event is um, in November at Central St. Martins and that is a forum to bring scientists and artists and creatives together to discuss sustainable design, for example. Um, and. I will, I'm also setting up this thing called the Nano for Design Roadshow, and, and we have prototyped that with an aerospace company. We went in and um, we had a roundtable discussion, and I have to say, the most pro, pro, uh, they brought together people from all parts of the company, people that wouldn't normally come into that space. And it was actually the marketing guys, Haru, who actually came up with this amazing application for this technology that nobody had thought of. And, um, you know, in a way, I think that those sort of you know, ideation clinics, sand pits, if you can suggest that to a company, and that's what I sort of tend to broker, well, look, can I send a company in to talk to you or somebody has an idea? Um, because then you can sign an NDA. I mean, confidentiality, I'm afraid, is the real world. And uh, if you're going to go into a company, they don't want you blabbing all your great ideas that could be worth IP because they don't want the threat either of you going back to them saying they've stolen your idea or you, you want your idea protected. So, you know, those basic, um, you have to face up to it. That you're, you're scaring gonna... people. No, 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 but it's a standard thing. It's a simple NDA to say that, you know, this, this whatever is in, discussed in that room stays in that room, as it were. I, think, I mean, know? actually, we, we don't do that purposefully with our right. collaborations. We, we take a commons approach, and actually, within creative industries, maybe different to the physical objects, um, okay. it's first mover advantage that's the thing. You just got to get your product to market quickly rather yeah. than worrying about those things. So I guess, again, there's, there's different levels of administration depending on the size of the collaboration. Questions, comments, heckles. That was quick. There's a roving mic, and as we're being filmed. Other way. Okay, I see a role for the Crafts Council here. Um, to initiate projects where artists or makers can come in contact with smaller and bigger industries. I have done, I am uh, from Textile Forum, the publisher, and I have done three um, art and industry projects myself. And the biggest problem was the translation. In my case, I've worked with German um, factories uh, for embroidery machines and for shakart machines, shakart weaving. And um, in, it, it came out because I asked them why they don't make better stuff with those wonderful machines. They only made really little duckies and stupid things, and they said they do not know any artist. And I thought they should know, and so I took just the best from America, and they all wanted to come to be able to work with those machines. I'm now talking about 91, so it was very early. And then the biggest problem was that the German director of the, of the factory would not take the artist serious because they were laying on the ground and wearing shorts. And that's what you don't do in Germany. And then I told them that they are professors and I could not believe it. So I had all the time to work between those two worlds 
and to tell the one that um, the other one is serious. And then we had the problem that the artist, they say, what happens if? That is their big, big creative thing. And the workers, they hear the artist say, what happens if? And they want, if they are Germans, they want to give a real answer and they want to do it. So what they do to please this, this uh, artist, they work through the night to make it happen. What she asked, what happens if? Next morning, very proud, they stand there, what's the artist saying? And the artist said, hmm, no, the other one was better, let's return it. <laughs> so she did that two times and then they went completely crazy. And, and then they left her alone and then the machine got on fire at some point, so it was really <laughs> dramatic then. And I think, uh, I, I did this role three times. It was very interesting for me to do and it is really a role that is needed. Some outside, I had to write about it, <coughs> I had to choose the artist, I had to calm down this, uh, directors and I had to speak both languages and I think the Crafts Council should find people who do such things. Yeah, thank you. We call it the unreasonable expectations of artists and, um, and, and, it, and, and we positively encourage that because um, if, a, if the person who's working with the technology doesn't know what it does they can design a fiction which, which a technologist can then make happen. Um, Team, um, do you want to start on responding to, I mean, how did you find Ubisense, who are a huge industry partner that you work with? Um, um, I found Ubisense in 2006 when I was making a piece of work which was um, a collaboration working with a technologist and a sound artist, and we sort of found our way together because we wanted something, to make something which sort of was breaking down the boundaries between the physical and the digital which is, I guess, in the area I move in a lot. And I do a lot of sort of kind of play and interaction. And we were making sculptural shoes that we wanted to have be tracked in a space. So we were quite sort of aware of the sort of a shoe is this kind of pretend you put on a shoe. It has this affordance that you put on your mum and dad's shoes or a big pair of clown shoes. And we were playing on all those sort of connotations. But we wanted um, to actually add sound, to create a soundscape. So we were looking for something which was a, a live tracking sort of a system. And in 2006, there wasn't so much of that about, but it's boomed a lot since. And live tracking is, is that you have an object in space and you know where it is. It's a fine-tuned GPS. You know, when you have your map, your GPS outside, you're always a few meters or it jumps around. <coughs> but Ubisense does live tracking of an object in space, which is an RFID tag. Um, and has sensors. So we learned that through looking online, a lot of online research, but also a lot of sort of kind of phone calling. It's what I call snowballing. It's you call someone and you kind of have a sense they might know someone and they, they know something. And you call them and say, blah, blah, we want to do this, we want to achieve this. And you've got to be prepared to let your idea go a little bit to with what you can do te technological. And then they say, oh no, what we have won't work. We should talk to this guy in research development. And you call, and people are usually really kind and generous because you're asking them about something they know about. And most people want to share their knowledge when it comes. And so you, kind of, you just kind of snowball with it. And then you go visit the people you find, and they demonstrate something, and you say, hey, should we work together? Or hey, can I get a good prize? Or you, know, you, kind of, you try to get them excited in your project. And I think that's... That probably is the most crucial advice. I say, why use technology? You've got to have a reason. You don't, you don't want to use technologies because it's good funding or because it's cool or because you just want to use it. You want to have something. You, want to, you don't want to be seduced by technology. You want to use it for a purpose, for whatever your subject matter is or however you want to change the world or not change the world, something. I mean, that there has to be a purpose. I think that's what drives people. You guys want to come in on the kind of role of the broker and we, how... We, we do it in two ways. Um, the first and probably the mo one of the most effective is just through serendipity of getting people to share the same space. The incubator is amazing for that. You know, there's the, I could cite a number of projects, but one of the most exciting at the moment is a social enterprise teamed up with a product designer, teamed up with a UX company and a gaming company developing solar lamps for the developing world that integrate all kinds of wonderful technologies. There's no way that could have happened without the brokerage of Ravensbourne, but not through a, a mastermind of any individual, just having those people sharing the same space and prototyping ideas and knocking ideas around over lunch and coffee and beer. 
uh, and just so creating those hubs and those communities are vital, I think, physical ones. UX for the non-digital people? Uh, user experience, uh, what the user wants and what the user could really do with the technology or the interface or the design. Um, and the other way is um, we host quite a number of successful hack fests and hack days that bring different types of people together. So an example is on the 26th and 27th of October, we're hosting a, a transmedia hack fest that brings storytellers, magicians, theatre performers, uh, coders and developers, uh, and business school PhDs from Sai Business School in Oxford all together to develop the business models of the future, the TV platforms of the future, and the stories of the future. Now, there has to, it probably happens already, but strikes me a craft stroke technology hack fest is just waiting to happen right now. You know, in the age of the Internet of Things, etc., I'd be amazed if someone isn't doing it already. If they're not, someone should jump in there and do it. Also turning up to, um, Heidi, who asked her a question earlier, has an idea that kind of uses space data, so it went to the NASA space hack day, and actually there's that kind of like, oh, you make stuff? That's brilliant. Yeah. Can we talk to you? And people are really joyful about kind of meeting people who aren't like them. Absolutely. I think the slight issue is we have two people here in the, in the ICT world, yeah, and there's a lot going on. There's all sorts of new opportunities in the sort of the physical world that I live in, i.e. Like making plastic things and ceramics and metals. We don't sort of have some of those models. I mean, the incubators are probably more difficult to get into. They're more for established companies. So in a way, there's something we perhaps can learn from the dynamic environment of you know, the electronic me new media world sure. that needs to be set up for the non-new media world. You know, sort of, I mean, the, the gen space type of concept for anybody, you know, that sort of thing, a, a place to come and play and try things out. Yep. And I think, I mean, we just said Internet of Things, but the idea that, um, that actually we're, we're moving away from technology on screens and moving into technology in objects, which opens up a whole brilliant um, opportunity for that conversation and for more rounded spaces and more interdisciplinary approaches, I guess. More questions? Okay, we have to finish on time as well. So if you can keep your question really brief, I'll make sure we are brief too. I'll, I'll try and keep it philosophically concise. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, is there a, are there ways we can encourage uh, people to, to use the spare capacity in our economy? So in a time of recession, we've got all kinds of industrial companies closing down. Um, you know, with sort of skills, um, skills and machinery that are kind of underused, and are the ways that we can encourage people to to go and kind of make use of those for custom tool to get custom tools and things like that. In the past, you'd have gone to a blacksmith um, and had it made, um, but but we're not in a situation where that seems to happen. Um, I'm sure most of us know of a, you know, a, an industrial estate where all the companies are closing down, um, but none of us ever sort of dare to go in and say, "Hey guys, could you knock me something up?" Um, so. If I take those two questions and then we can try and, um, so it was the lady in pink, I think? Uh, thank you. Um, you are each from a different discipline. I just wanted to ask, do you use 3D virtual environments in your work in any way? Just wanted to. 3D, 3D virtual, virtual environments. environments. Cool. And the lady with the black and white stripes top. It may come across as quite a negative question, but it's meant in a positive way. <laughs> and it was just kind of with collaboration, obviously, there are so many positive aspects. But as a maker myself, the, the consideration I have is, is there ever a feeling that an element of identity is lost on either side of the collaboration, really? Because as a maker, you, sh you strive quite hard to kind of develop that identity, you know. Cool. Is there ever the worry of it being lost, and how do you overcome it if it is lost? So we've got the making use of spare capacity, um, uh, the use of virtual uh, 3D environments, and the question of identity, and I guess what happens to a collaboration, what is added and what is taken away when you collaborate? I'm happy to. Oh. In terms of the spare capacity, the vision, the reason I joined Ravensbourne was um, this vision of what if we could establish the 24-hour university with open doors to community for exactly that reason. I'm now in a quite a unique position where I, my role is co-funded by the local authority from a regeneration economic development perspective and the college um, to do exactly that. How can an institution like Ravensbourne that invested £72 million really benefit the regeneration of a whole area? Uh, and through leveraging sources of funding at the moment, European funding, we're able to make the facilities of Ravensbourne accessible to businesses and SMEs to do exactly that, regenerate the area, address the declining uh, industrial 
environment of the area and, and stimulate new jobs and new economies. So there are ways of doing it, but obviously funding helps. Uh, European funding can come into play. And I, I think in all the cases of all towns, cities, the role of the local authority is pivotal to that. Partnership with the local authority, you really care about the end goal, the long goal, the future of those communities and the future jobs of those communities. Those partnerships are critical. You now, universities sit on tens of millions of pounds worth of kit and investment that is not used for 50% of its time, and the depreciation value of that technology is immense. Get it used, open those doors, and that can happen through partnership with local, local authorities who have that other agenda. Uh, 3D environments, um, there's a new initiative about to be launched called the National Virtual Incubator, which is a Cisco initiative, Ravensbourne and Greenwich are part of it, which will connect um, the incubation hub and cluster at, at Greenwich Peninsula with Cambridge, um, with Salford, Manchester, with Liverpool and other destinations to do exactly that. The technology is getting there to make that virtual collaboration really meaningful. So I think you're going to see a, an explosion of virtual collaboration spaces across the network imminently as part of the smart cities agenda. Um, the third question, not really my Team, perhaps you want to yeah. I recognize your kind of concern for, I have the same when I collaborate, and, and I also have to recognize that sometimes I get very territorial about my idea, and I go, it's mine, it's mine. And you know, that doesn't always work in a collaboration. So um, I think that what is good is to kind of accept that you have to have a conversation which is called, what's in it for me? and you kind of have to be honest. Um, but I think quite often, if you are a technologist and an artist, you come from so different fields that you can go away with a quite clear ownership of each your part that comes together for a bigger part. I think actually it's diff more difficult if you're two artists working together. I would probably kind of come up against some kind of conflict there that might be difficult to resolve. But to lead me to the other bit is that I think conflict, it, you have to accept that there's conflicts. And that's okay. I was setting up yesterday at the VNA for the Digital Vegan with uh, Tom Mitchell. He's programming for me, and we were bickering. I mean, that's what we were doing, but in a kind of debate kind of way. Because what it really came down to was method. I kind of we were doing something difficult, um, technological. We were calibrating a space, and you know it's down to millimeter something, and we were discussing how was the best way to do this correctly and we were aware that it was could go wrong so easily like technology sometimes do and um, but after it we kind of I laughed and I said oh yeah we're like siblings bickering and that's quite often what happens and, and you kind of just that's okay mm -hmm. you know conflict is good in some ways and I think you have to accept it but you have to have that honest conversation first that's called <coughs> what's in it for me yeah what what do we both want singly and what do we want together and I think um I'm on the board of a company called Hide and Seek, and I was uh, lucky enough to go and spend some time in their office. And at the beginning of every project, they write the kind of they write a document which talks about what are the what's the culture of this project, how do we want to behave within this project, and what are the things we know that we won't break, the, the kind of golden rules. And we've totally taken that for our collaborations now because we've really, really messed some up where we just weren't explicit enough with people about what we wanted, and also we made assumptions about what they wanted. More questions? Okay. What about the, um, the size issue? And I guess uh, for me, there's, there's a kind of size, organizational culture, and, um, and differing time scales. How, what's the best way to kind of approach that so you don't feel swamped by what you're about to go into? I think your point about honesty at the very beginning is key, and accepting that it isn't going to work all the time. And it's not. It's not going to work all the time. Um, but I think, again, I'm seeing a lot of big agencies, huge agencies, global companies wanting more and more to collaborate with small, innovative companies that think differently. You know, we're in a, an, area where, an era where big business is beginning to rethink how it does business, who it collaborates with, and how it achieves its goal. So it's a really rich time, I think, for big and small to come together. I think that if you are in a situation where you're working with a big company, you just have to remember your value. You know, you're an artist, you're a craft maker, you have a unique way of looking at the world that they perhaps don't have. It's about that you have two different kinds of methodologies and you bring your methodology of looking at the world and they have theirs and, and you each have value and it doesn't matter, big or small, really doesn't matter. But I guess you kind of have to remind yourself that because it can be daunting. Yeah, I think... Um it's, it's an interesting question, and I think, you know, the size one is an important, you know, a lone sole trader is 
taking on a lot to walk into a major company. But they do, most of them do have an open research, open source research program now. And they are looking for new ideas because they have problems to solve. Now, and very often that they're quite open to say, well, you know, we're looking 10 years out, so actually come with your completely bonkers ideas. Uh, and I went to an ideation clinic for two days with a major drinks uh, manufacturer recently. But okay, I had, if you like, nothing to lose. We were just chucking ideas into the pot. But if I was uh, somebody who was trying to sell my expertise, it maybe would have been a bit difficult for me, as you say, a bit protectionist. But uh, I say they are looking for ideas, and I think if you, if you look to see what you could help somebody with, so if you're reducing their carbon footprint or helping them in some way, they'll want to hear from you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would just... Um, I mean, you could use somebody like the KTNs as, almost as a, as a broker to sort of come in with you or to make, set up the deal, because then I would, you know, basically somebody, they know that um, somebody else has been involved in that interaction. It's a little bit of a, it's like posting something back to yourself, I feel. Great, well, I am going to wrap this up um, so that we finish on time, but Teen really wants to say something, so <laughs> go on. No, I just wanted to say, because. I don't know how digital kind of happy you are, but there's lots of little places, and I can see there's lots of women in the audience. There's a place called Meztec, who does workshops for women, and you know you go and you learn to solder, or you make a little sol solar bot, solar powered little um, robot, or they give you a circuit which is easy to make, and they do different kind of workshops, um, because the digital world is quite male. So, just a little tip. Plug. Well, I was also, <laughs> I was going to plug the uh, Watershed Crafts Council residencies that we're doing with Falmouth and IDAT, but I don't need to because everyone's been so lovely about uh, plugging them today, but I am going to plug Tracking You for Teen, which is at the V&A this weekend as part of their digital weekend, and I had the joy of playing with it last week in the studio because it's been set up to test in our studio. You get capes and they've got RFID on them. They know where you are, and you can swoosh and whoosh around the space, and it will trigger loads of crazy noises. It, they are really super fun, and, I, and there's loads of brilliant things going on down there as well, isn't there? So, Please come along. Great. Please join me in thanking the panelists.